Hello and welcome to another episode of the CG Garage. This is episode number 478 featuring Andy Fowler, who has been in the production side of visual effects for a long time and has has a long, long career in that area. He is a producer, con consultant in the industry, and has done some incredible work. Uh, you'll, you'll learn about his history, but he's also, you know, he was over at Disney and he was overseeing a lot of the virtual, uh, visual effects stuff over at Disney. Uh, in fact, uh, he and I both worked on Tron, but to very different capacities and in very different roles. Uh, he was the VFX uh, uh, studio side producer on it. Uh, but at some point, he was responsible for over 10,000 shots per year. So yeah, that is a lot of work. And he also did uh, was over at Netflix, and he was responsible for a lot of innovation and stuff in visual effects uh, over at Netflix. Really cool to hear about that. Uh, but it's really cool to have someone like Andy on to give us his perspective on where the industry is going, things like virtual production, things like AI are really interesting, which is another place where I ran into Andy. He was moderating uh, virtual production, uh, a virtual production AI panel over at AI on the lot. And you noticed in the last few episodes, I've had several people on that I met at that event. So it was really kind of an interesting event to have. So really cool to have Andy on. Really good to interesting to hear his what his thoughts are on that and where we're going with that. So thank you, Andy, so much. Uh, we don't have any events going on right now specifically, but if you'd like to know more, just go to chaos.com slash events. That's where we list all of our events that you might be interested in going to. Uh, I do have a product announcement, a couple of product announcements. Uh, I do mention a Project Arena, which is what I've been working on very, very hard in the last several years. Uh, we do have an announcement about that. So just go to chaos.com slash virtual production. If you'd like to learn more about our virtual production efforts and sign up, if you happen to have a virtual production stage, LED stage, or you're working with one uh, and you'd like to know more about how your project could benefit from Project Arena, that would be a good place to do that. If you just like to know more about our real-time ray tracing capabilities uh, with Vantage, which is the core part of Project Arena, you can always just try Vantage. Uh, and uh, to speaking of that, uh, Vantage 2 Update 4 is out. We've got some new things, including support for UDIMs and decals that has been uh, long awaited for. And more, of course, don't forget to try that out. So again, that is at uh, chaos.com to know more about that. Uh, if you want to know more about the podcast, uh, the podcast, of course, our podcast page is chaos.com slash CG Garage. If you'd like to uh, follow us on Facebook, it is facebook.com slash CG Garage Podcast. If you'd like to watch this podcast, uh, we store all our videos, including our podcast videos at uh, youtube.com slash chaos group TV. If you'd like to suggest more people to come on the podcast, uh, something that we've been getting great suggestions and are definitely welcome, uh, email us labs at chaos.com. Again, that email email is labs at chaos.com. But for now, please enjoy episode number 478 with Andy Fowler. Welcome to another CG Garage, where the chaos group talks. You'll know it's over when the last bucket drops. We're gonna fire off rays in high dynamic range. We know that ambient occlusion is passe. Global illumination won't lead you astray. And while image-based lighting is really swell, you need to make sure everything has for now. A little bit into your past, like how did how did you get involved in visual effects in the film industry, and what, what was your origin story? Sure. Okay. Wow. Um, how long is this podcast? <laughs> We've got an hour, but I'm sure we can do it. <laughs> okay. No, I, I'll take a uh, hopefully not too yeah. long another hour. Okay. Yeah. I, I, but you know, it's interesting. Um, uh, at least um, you know, I feel I came into the business a little bit sort of um, through a, a back door in a way. Um, you know, uh, my, I mean, I'm in my fifties, sure. and you know going back a few years when I started in the industry, there wasn't really VFX, um, you know, in the traditional sense that we think of it now, obviously digital visual effects, et cetera. But, um, you know, uh, I left school very young. I was like 16, 17 when I actually mm. left school. Um, I was so focused on wanting to get into the industry somehow um, that I felt like I went to college and did other, other that really stuff that I they lose those those precious years of finding a way. Um, now it worked out well in the end, but it wasn't uh -huh. easy. Um, cut a very long story short. Um, you know, I started uh, trying to get jobs in the industry. Was turned away, as you can imagine, left, right, and centre. I still have my rejection letter from Lucasfilm from forty or wow. years ago. Um, so that's that, or whenever it was. But um, so that's fun. Um, but no, it was effectively, um, 
through knocking on doors. Um, you know, if I was 17 or 18 when I first got a job at a brand new company in London called English Market mm-hmm. Pocket. Um, although I had been doing some interesting work before that in my own space, um, you know, Super 8, et cetera. Um, and I um, was their first employee. And English Market Pocket was a uh, run by um three graphic designers from the bbc who started um and again actually this is early 80s early to mid 80s right so you've got to think about where the industry was at that point um and i was their first employee they loved the fact that i knew about cameras they knew loved the fact that i was young and enthusiastic about wanting to make stuff um and uh they they invited me in so at a very young age i kind of like um started working in if you think of graphic design back in the day, it was kind of utilizing a lot of early digital tools and, and workflows and platforms. You know, um, you know, you think of money for nothing, that type of uh-huh. video. It's kind of the Bosch FGS sort of like a, a sort of um, computer pro, uh, computer at the time. It's that's what we're talking about. That very early uh, entry level stuff, right back yeah. in the years, back in the. I'm a huge Dire ago. Straits fan, so. so. <laughs> I didn't work on it, but that's the type of stuff I'm talking about, right? It was literally that very basic sort of early entry level stuff. So um, now um, I started producing commercials um, and music videos and graphic sequences like when I was like 19 or 20 for this company. Um, And they ended up sort of winning a lot of rewards and and we did a lot of really cool stuff, right? So, but that was my sort of entry into this crazy world. And, you know, um, I, did a, a, a commercial with MPC back in the day, um, which was just a lot of host of digital effects and model miniature shooting, et cetera, which I had the joy of putting mm-hmm. together um, as the producer. And it, and I guess when I look back at it now, I actually looked at it recently, and I was like, wow, that was visual effects. <laughs> that, I mean, it really was back in the day, an early um, digital compositing, you know, actually some optical mm-hmm. as well, a lot of uh, miniatures, et cetera. So that was the pull of, of, of the industry, you know, upon me and sort of gave me that start um to cut a very long story short you know i went from that you know uh, from english market pocket to one or two other companies in that same space um and then ended up sort of heading a production or heading production at a sort of post facility a post facility called vcr in london just at the time when lost in space the film oh, yeah. of the film lost in space with Gary Gary Oldman, Oldman, yeah. um stephen hopkins directing you know, um, I was working at a company who just opened up a company within that within that company, and they'd won an awful lot of shots on that on that on that movie somehow. Um, and it was all digital, like you know, it was all basically CG and, and digital compositing. Domino back in the day, actually, of course, which was eight bit. Uh, and there were ten people, and they had like four or five hundred shots, of which many were CG, fully CG shots with motion, facial motion capture, mm-hmm. etc. Very very difficult stuff. And I thought, oh yeah, that sounds like fun. <laughs> Um, little did I know that it would be the start of my career in Interesting. visual effects, really properly. Right? And what were you so doing mostly at this to, time? What yeah. was your what was your responsibility? Yeah, I mean, look, I, I come from into this space very much from a production standpoint. I think, as I kind mm-hmm. of mentioned, really, um, someone that's used to using a comfortable using new technology, definitely sort of pushing boundaries along the way. Um, obviously, probably through as much blind enthusiasm that it is a, a, a knowledge necessarily a deep sure. knowledge. But I have found myself, um, you know, sort of entering into this space, you know, from a production background, trying to solve challenges and, you know, the problem sets that you face in a production and Create, you know, when you're faced with creative sort of challenges that actually, you know, f- are trying to find a place, trying to find a way. Um, and so, yeah, that's kind of how I come into it. Um, you, um, you know, as a result, though, um, I've found myself on a box occasionally um, learning and doing stuff. I sort of did some digital map painting for a movie or two uh, back in the day using Inferno, etc. So I kind of, um, you know, have always sort of dabbled a little bit on the box to better understand the challenges that artists might face Mm -hmm. as well, right? Because, you know, from a production standpoint, it's good to understand, um, I guess, the reality of, 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 um, you know, the different facets of of VFX production. Um, So, yeah, so that was basically it. Um, So I came in, Lost in Space, first movie, first, I think first predated Harry Potter. Right. Um, So it was the first, well, I said digital visual effects show in Mm -hmm. London. Right, and I ended up sort of producing a big part of that. So that yeah, that was, a, was around two thousand. Am I right about that? Pre that, ninety five, oh, ninety six. Okay, yeah, yeah, mid nineties. Yeah. yeah, so um, back in the day, right? Um, but yeah, really, I realized from that moment on, recognized that you know this was a real career. 
<laughs> you know, um, saw a huge opportunity and sort of um, fortunately went on to work a lot with uh, with um, Terry Gilliam's company, Peerless. Mm. I, I ran that for a while wow. um, in London um, with Kent Houston and Paul Doherty. That was that was a lot of fun back in the day. Um, Paul Doherty actually started a company called Electric oh, yeah. Image, which I'm not sure if... if um, so I worked very closely with Paul um, on a bunch of different projects and commercials back in the 90s, yeah, for sure, and 80s. Um, so yeah, again, that's really sort of my, my background. And then I was thrown into... Um, you know, sort of on the on the on the face, if you like, actually running um, production for VFX for the studio for the production. Um, so it was kind of a freelance VFX producer. Um, once I left um, in Terry's mm-hmm. company, um, did you know a bunch of things, Tomb Raiders, um, three hundred, oh, the wow, first yeah. three hundred movie, um, and Narnia yeah. as well. So and a bunch of others, Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. <laughs> Um, you know, a bunch of really fun and interesting shows of different scales. Those are huge you know. shows. Um, Those are great. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. They're fun, fun, fun shows and actually all very, very yep. different as well. Yep. 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 So, yeah. And that, that really led me to um, being on executive at a studio. So once I'd, you know, done the facility thing, done the production thing, now I was in the studio side with, with Disney for okay. a few years. Um, and so had, was, was looking at the business from very much a different um, perspective. And, you know, Tron Legacy was one of my shows um, at, Net, at yeah. Disney. Um, I worked on Tron Legacy. As well, but that, <laughs> yes, we had the conversation, I think, <laughs> yeah. at the time, didn't we, when we met a few couple uh-huh. of weeks ago. Um, so that was fantastic. And then went on to other studios, New Regency, The Revenant, and one or two other things there. And, and more recently, of course, overseeing VFX globally for Netflix um, and virtual yeah. production. Right, um, very much kickstarting their their sort of um, um, their their place in that particular conversation for the studio, and that was again a, a tremendous um, um, time and experience for me at the studio. Now. Well, that is a very quick summary uh, of a very rich career. So I am going to dive back into different parts of this to sort of get this okay. back right. on track. Sure. Well, so this was incredible, uh, mm-hmm. and 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 really incredible to to to, ha- to hear those stories. But I want to know more about like those some of those. Trends transition moments and how that was different for you. Like, you know, when you were, you know, let's, let's go back to, you know, working at a facility and then sort of transitioning right. to being a, 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 a production side producer, right. Or right. a freelance producer for, uh, for the studio side of representation. What was, what was that like? And then what was it like to be sort of much more uh, separated from being a client <laughs> or yeah. having clients? Hmm. You know, it, it's a, good, a good, great question. Um, you know, I think um, it was actually very much harder than mm. I expected it to be. Actually, the transitions, um, because the, you know, anyone that's been in any one of those areas and has an understanding, looking through a window into the other areas, how different they are and what the expectations and roles mm-hmm. are very different. So, I mean, a good example, or maybe a bad one, is um, you know transitioning, say, from mm-hmm. Narnia, which was a big, very big movie. I think it was, you know, um, Prince Caspian was the second one. It was a huge shoot across many continents, and you know, it was very complex in many ways. Um, you know, and you know, has a has a toll, right? As a as a VFX producer, because you are the one person responsible for just about everything in terms of budget schedule. They're all vendors, filmmakers, everything, and it's a fantastic experience. Right. Very hands-on. <laughs> so when you end up transitioning into more on the studio side, uh, which is much more of an executive position of with more with a lot of overview, overview across many sure. projects, um, it's a little bit more sort of a step back, um, and you know different conversations on actually very different timescales and timeframes. So you go from uh, an environment where you're a real problem mm-hmm. solver in the moment, yeah, right, to I'm very much on the cold how do we get this like, shot done someone, and all this stuff, right? <laughs> yeah, or yeah, or just whole sure. sequences, you know, like really figuring out you know how we're gonna um you know break down these big challenges on these very big big productions mm-hmm. and that was awesome um you know working with all the different sort of departments etc yeah. really love that um but then you work at a studio which again it comes with these challenges and then i recognized um that you know you've got to just take a breath <laughs> You know, you've got to just ride the horse. Actually, I used to work for a gentleman called Art Rapola, who was the head of VFX uh-huh. at Disney. And he was just, he just said to me, Andy, just ride the horse. Um, and so there was a very, very good advice. Um, the responsibility is, like I say, very different because, again, in the moment challenges or actually maybe just in the near term, just on the horizon. With the studio, it's like just over the horizon. It's like you're thinking about, okay, what are the right budget 
parameters for this show you're going to have in a year from now, mm-hmm. right? What kind of scope should we be thinking? What kind of conversations do we need to be having with the director, whoever it might be, early on to help put the early building blocks in place? Right. Um, and those are just very different conversations. So sometimes the transitions and timescales are just very different. And I found it difficult to adapt from from that sort of, um, re- not reactive, but certainly most re- reactive was something which was a little bit more over longer time frames and more considered. Um, but it, I got there, but it, but it definitely took Do me. Do you bit. feel that uh, it was from a creative point of view, because I, this is one thing that I think people sometimes forget is that producers are, are very creative in a lot of ways and trying to figure out how to right. solve problems. They don't necessarily put pen to paper or put ink to, or, or paint to canvas, but they do figure out like what paint to buy <laughs> and how to get the right, right thing. Right. Yeah. And so, and, and those are yeah. creative decisions that are being made, but do you feel that when you transitioned to that executive position that you had less creative parts or did you feel that you actually had a bigger 35,000 you know, foot view of things and you actually had a better perspective right. of everything. Yeah. I mean, I mean, creativity obviously comes in many sure. forms, right. Um, you know, certainly, you know, when I was working on say 300, mm-hmm. um, you know, there was a particular sequence, which we shot underwater, mm-hmm. um, which was an idea I had based upon, you know, a music video I'd seen several years before. Um, and sort of, you know, you apply, um, you know, level of creativity through, I guess, production sure. experience. So it kind of, there's, you know, you're right. This is it's applied in different ways, but on the studio side, I guess more recently at Netflix, um, you know, I was there for, you know, for six years, I was the first, um, in, uh, person in for VFX. So I created mm-hmm. that group, um, globally. It was just a wonderful opportunity to get creative in different ways. Right. Um, you know, just, one thing to consider, um, you know, when you're I was at Disney, I was probably managing, I don't know, maybe seven or 8,000 shots a year, mm-hmm. maybe, right, compared to 100,000 shots a year at, at Netflix, right? So um, you have to think crazily about how you even achieve right. that. It's, you know, it's, you try and find a quality at scale sure. and, and appropriately. So, so it comes with a different set of, of challenges, all of which actually I found really sort of um, interesting, invigorating and highly mm-hmm. creative. Um, but actually with a little bit more of a, that considered future facing mentality, uh, of, you know, how do we solve for, you know, the next two or three or five sure. years rather than the, the challenges today. And one of those as simple as crazy as was just resource strategy, you know, just, you know, there wasn't, there's, you know, understanding how many artists we need every day, where, to what competency, what level to do, what type of work was a question no one had asked before. So you have to start thinking and breaking down the business in a what seems like a very sort of, um, you know, again, business development kind of sure. type of way where, you know, with a lot of strategy around sort of resource. And maybe does that sound interesting? Maybe not to some, but to me it was fascinating because you have to really get to know the industry at a very, um, you know, micro right. level, right? Um, so it's a macro, micro role. And, and then you begin to solve, you know, those big, big uh challenges you know by breaking it down and figuring out how you can what mechanisms you can replace what tool sets you can put in bro- mm-hmm. into place but also what are the opportunities around new technology like virtual production was something i, I kind of looked at you know back in 2016 um you know when i was uh, you know i'd heard about sort of obviously some of the work that um disney were doing mm-hmm. mandalorian back in you know it's very early sure. days then um but recognizing you know if we could you know create content at scale um you know by sort of bringing some of that work forward you know and having the work done in camera it just seemed to me like wow if we could achieve something along those lines um maybe that's an opportunity to do something more uh, um than the traditional sort of workflows we were using at the time and you know we, we hit some quite a, some success there we had certain sure. challenges you know but we did a bunch of shows that i felt like 1899 i think it's a great example um, where 80 percent of the show was shot against the volume and i think we got 50 percent mm-hmm. in camera camera um so you know, think about that at scale that's an awful lot of opportunity to improve you know timelines right and bring maybe bring down costs potentially right. as well um but certainly improve timelines and that sort of gets more on screen quicker hopefully to high quality so all that kind of stuff i'm dealing with at the studio level i found extremely crazy I'd yeah. say, okay i i want to i want to get into virtual production but i also want to touch a little bit on on your on your time at disney obviously you know big influential company probably one of the biggest ones especially in the visual effects world right now in terms of the amount of uh, of 
uh, demand that is necessary to create some of those visions. Right. Yeah. Um, but uh, you know, back then when I was you know looking back at, at Tron, right, and and I worked on on the, the movie, and it sort of reminisced with me of 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 Disney doing live action work that was very interesting when they were taking some of the things that they had owned and sort of bringing new life to them into a new way. What right. was it like to sort of be at Disney during that time of you know, like the Trons and the Maleficent and all of those types of shows? You right. Know? <laughs> yeah. Um, it's certainly um, recognizing, you know, it was there during the Dick Cook era. Yeah. I mean, you know, he was there, I was there towards the end of his, of his, his, his time there. Um, and certainly, you know, recognize that, um, you know, he well, he recognized, you know, that um, the the animation um, portion of the business, and of course, you know, this is my, I wasn't high up at the sure. company, but I was like, listen in and get an understanding that it felt like everyone was very much aware that, you know, one had to transition into a live action version, effectively rendition of what had been a very successful animated piece and um, IP for the studio to just change things up, to keep things moving forward in a, with a different view. And I think that was interesting to see that transition um for the company be there to some degree in those early days um and i think um you know obviously the dave terratero who's head of vfx um and and, and phil stoyer uh, in the production side i think i've done a tremendous job of 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 maintaining and managing that sort of quality and that level of storytelling in that live action sure. space um so but it was something that at the time you know certainly was um was new and I think very challenging um, from a creative standpoint. But I think, you know, look, I, I didn't have as much to do with that as, as say, obviously David sure. has today. He's been there, I think, 10, 11 years, so he's done pretty right. much all of them. Uh, but certainly back in the early days, it was interesting to see, um, uh, yeah, that transition and rec but recognize, I think, as Dick Cook did, that it was a necessary step for the studio to take for it to you know, sort of, you know, continue to grow in a, in a new I area. think it's interesting just in the fact that there's so much legacy and importance to animation at this Disney in some ways, and then suddenly you bring it into a live action world. That legacy has to be passed on to both yeah. live action and visual effects, right? So you have to have the visual effects yeah. that work it. And so the complete vision of what Disney was doing was very interesting. And by the way, I think there's there's actually this these moments of Disney, especially like I loved working on Tron. I got to tell you, I, I loved it. It was a great. Mm great uh, uh thing is also i i knew joe before uh tron so seeing him get this big movie to me was just really really satisfying to see that happen so i was very excited uh, for that but it looks beautiful i think yeah. it looks absolutely gorgeous um and and i think that the, the vision that joe had and that disney had uh was so well done so <laughs> Yeah. yeah, Joe did a fantastic job, and obviously digital yep. domain, right? Um, um, you know, obviously they were basically the lead vendor, if not for most mm -hmm. of the show. Um, and you know, Eric Barber, the supervisor, did a tremendous job. Um, and yeah, it was mind blowing because. Um, you know, obviously it was very challenging, as, as we know, um, with pretty much the whole movie for the most part being a visual effect. Um, and, and it pushed, again, pushing boundaries, you know, when it comes to digital humans and, you know, the work with obviously, you know, um, Jeff Bridges was, was mm -hmm. tough. And, and when it worked, when it worked well, it was mm -hmm. incredible. Right. Um, but, you know, as we know, consistency is always very important, you know, when it comes to right. visual effects. And uh, The Irishman was one of my movies at Netflix um, that I, you know, helped you know, sort of a little bit, sure. with, you know, um, so it was very, a little bit involved with Pablo for ILM mm -hmm. there as well. And, you know, recognizing that, you know, when you're working at that level, a super high level, um, consistency is key. You know, you can't, you know, you really can't let your nope. guard down. You know, you're only as good as the, your best, as the, you're almost as good as yeah. the worst shot, I guess. Right. Um, yep. And so, I mean, Tron had, had a lot of great vision, a lot of great spectacle. And I think, you know, it was a real challenge to sort of maintain yeah. that level. I try, I, I managed, I, I started a group years and years ago called the, the Wiki Human Project. And because I was obsessed about understanding digital humans and how things work. And I've talked to Ed Ulbrich about it quite a bit. Ed obviously is very involved right. in digital humans, as you know. And so yeah. is Eric Barba and I yeah. know Eric. So it's, uh, and Steve Preeg and, all those guys so uh yeah. but uh but yeah it's really really interesting and we could talk a little bit more about digital humans but now let's go to let's let's skip forward to, to netflix so you said you you sort of started this and 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 in the visual effects group when did you start there and how, there must have been a massive ramp up during your time there oh yeah oh my goodness <laughs> yeah well again the the recognition um 
um, having just come from your agency, mm-hmm. right? I was managing a couple of films, like it was, again, The Revenant or um, you know, Assassin's Creed, but it was all very sort of almost in serial rather sure. than parallel, right? Um, I'm working very closely with the filmmaker, I mean, super closely, um, to um, a, a, an environment where literally in my first week, 6,000 shots. <sighs> Like whether that was Stranger Things or Oakja, which was a movie in Korea, yep. um, or you know whatever you name it, um, shows in India, shows in, just all beginning to burgeon. Whether it was breaking down scripts or getting shots to a creative or assigning vendors or assigning talent, right? Um, I just realised that I was doing in one week what I probably did at Disney in, in a year at right. that time, right? Now um, and things have changed at Disney. Everything's changing. There's a lot more scale and sure. scope everywhere. Um, but at the time, it was kind of like, wow, this is crazy. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, for me, that was a real um, eye-opening, eye-watering moment um, to recognize I was in at the ground floor of something like just very new. I didn't know really what I was letting myself in for when I walked what, in. The what what did they ask space. you to do? Something. Like, what was the job description? Well, well <laughs> Well, Ty Warren, who was the head of production, head of physical uh-huh. production, um, uh, brought me on board. And I'd worked a little bit with him at Legendary because I did some gotcha. work for those guys there. Um, and so he joined and I, you know, I went through the interview process, which takes a beat there. And uh, yeah, it was, look, pretty much a blank canvas. Um, I mean, Ty said to me, you know, um, the role really was trying to understand what VFX meant for Netflix and therefore the, maybe the, the broader industry. Um, and it was just very, you know, literally almost one, one line and then deal appropriately, right. <laughs> you know, sort of, what does that mean? So, you know, yeah, I, I joined, um, and then realized, you know, that, um, by the way, maybe just a little bit of context sure. setting, um, when it comes to working on the studio side, um, one thing I recognized from sort of other other experiences of other studios on that in, in that side of the business is, you know, it's all about fire prevention. We talk about fire fighting, you know, and it's like the fire fighting comes from often a badly planned production or right. show, right? Or something changing, right? And a lot of things change all the time. So it's not always about bad planning. It's just things mm-hmm. change, right? Um, but the, the most you can do to plan and get ahead of what that fire could be, the better. And, and that's what a lot of that's how I approached um, my my role at Netflix is, which is how I dealt with, dealt with it at other studios. It's like, well, let's consider all the problems that we might have on this production, uh, and then try and sort of get ahead of that. And often that comes from just hiring the right people at the right time on the show. It's something as simple mm-hmm. as that, right? Casting is number one, right? So um, when I joined Netflix, it was like, number one on my mind was, okay, let's break down the shows, where they're at in the production, you know, how much influence can I have to help, you know, f- prevent the fire, and how many fires, are, you know, can I help uh, mitigate, right? So you beca- it comes a little bit of a sort of um, an intelligence exercise around, or data exercise around that. And then, you know, beginning to sort of influence those productions either ahead of time or in the moment, appropriately, mm-hmm. um, with the right people, with me, or whoever it might be. And so that was the wrestle for me at, in the early days. Um, um, you know, providing value. Now, <clears throat> the value of that is you save millions of dollars in VFX by by having it planned and done properly, right? One executive is worth their weight in gold, right. right? If they've thought about and planned appropriately and casted with the right vendors, right? you know what I mean? Absolutely. It's just right, the whole the whole kind of um, um, the chemistry of it all, right, is really important. Um, so if you can, if you have the right executives, um, which I was blessed with having, bringing on board some great mm-hmm. people, um, um, then, then that goes a long way to making them efficient from day one, hopefully to the end and you save a lot right. of money. Right. Um, and so that was really very a, you know, high level. What I was obviously my remit, if I can do great quality work at a reasonable cost with the right, with, uh, with great people. Um, and providing value to filmmakers that's the, that's basically it so kind of with that mindset you think about okay then what's preventing me from doing mm-hmm. that and i realized there was an awful lot of things um but but you start to break that down and one of them of course as went back, back mentioned earlier was of course resource strategy and planning just you know you know it's one thing to say we're going to make something but have you got enough of the bits to make that sure. thing Right. And that was obviously another question. And we realized very quickly we didn't always have enough bits. So my role was also, therefore, to have help put in, put in certain strategies to to make sure that we had a lot of intelligence around you know, resource talent to make sure we had the right bits to make the, the right thing or the thing at the right level. And so all of that stuff became, you know, kind of a big part of my role as I built teams globally. Mm-hmm. Right. 
um, VFX executives um, who had local knowledge, you know, in Korea and Latin America and obviously everywhere around the world, yep. so that they could be in that meeting, right, when that script comes in or when the idea for, is first floated to get ahead of the, of the of the challenges that that production may face. So you just ask the right right questions much right. earlier on. As a result of all that, you know, it just things work out a lot easier for everybody. So that was really when I think at a high level that became my role very quickly just mitigation early planning um, understanding resource understanding you know the world of visual effects at a level that I'd never really got into before so that's great now I'm going to throw a wrench at it how did you manage yeah. the pandemic <laughs> Because that is uh, massive yeah. demand, complete change of schedule, probably huge demands on visual effects. Yeah. Like, how did that happen? Especially at Netflix, yeah, which right. probably wanted to produce 10 times more than they ever produced, right? It's a good question. I mean, you know, um, I go back to, uh, I mean, fortunately, I, 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 I think one of my greatest talents is understanding my limitations, <laughs> sure. right? So if you understand what you're not good at, right, what your limitations are, you hire right. accordingly. Um, so, you know, I, done, I think at that point, by the time COVID hit in early 2020, right? Yeah. Um, I'd, I'd managed to put in place just the most incredible team of, of, of professionals on Netflix. Um, you know, and I think of... Um, you know, uh, where they are now, they're sort of running studio, running VFX at other studios and whatever else they're doing, but they're, they're just tremendous talent. So when, when it hit, obviously VFX is obviously one slice of, you, know, you might call the, the trivial pursuit sure. wheel, right? Um, but, you know, um, I felt that we were in a really good place to manage it because by that time I had a real network of intelligence coming from all of my different teams globally. We put in place a platform within the studio for VFX specifically about managing resource, understanding um, who's doing what, where, and how much, and strains on resource, and a lot of slate planning and future planning. So there was a lot of not already in place uh, um, if there were new stresses that sure. came in, right, for us to sort of plan other models or new models and pivot accordingly. So by the time, say, COVID come, had hit, I had a great team. Um, and, and some great tool sets to be able to sort of plan how to pivot mm -hmm. um, appropriately. So, you know, that was awesome. We'd, we'd also set up, um, sort of built out uh, uh, a cloud-based facility because we're on the AWS, um, as, as, you know, obviously as, as, as that mm -hmm. beating heart, right? Um, we sort of built, um, one of the concepts I had was to um, leverage that to some degree, Um and you know, build a cloud facility for VFX that we could onboard artists and they could just do work for us remotely. Yeah. So I had that in nice. place. Um, and we were doing 10,000 shots a year on. Wow. That. So, um, yeah, I mean, just, just um, you know, so there were a few things that we had managed to sort of pull the levers on and get in uh -huh. play without it, without knowing about right. COVID that when it came around, actually, we could pivot quite Interesting. well. Interesting. Interesting. Well, that's really... That's really cool. I think that's, that's, those are, those are the kind you know, the, I think that people that can be nimble in that way, especially at a scale that you guys are operating is kind of surprising and awesome at the same time. Yeah, no, I mean, that, that was, I mean, again, you know, I was often asked, why do you need so many people? You got so many people, you know, in all these different countries. And I said, well, you know, um, there's nothing worse than having one leader that um, is is deciding everything for everyone when it's when it's so nuanced right. at a local level, right? Um, not just in terms of from a cultural perspective, but also in terms of how much different types of content sure. is being made, whether it's series, features, limited series, whatever it is, documentary, scripted. It's it's, it's you need people that understand the local marketplace. Um, uh, and can provide their own intelligence and, and you help them with tool sets or whatever it is. And so really, yeah, I mean, for me, it was a joy to see the team come together and work so well under such difficult sure. circumstances, but also supporting the industry right. in the, under difficult circumstances. And that was something that for me was critical um, as a studio executive was to make sure that we were um, contributing to the industry uh, in a way that, you know, maybe is dif was difficult mm -hmm. elsewhere. Um, so that, you know, I'd find ways of, of um, you know, committing to a vendor from a financial standpoint, you know, um, um, you know, across what I call global deals that meant that they had um, a base layer, right, right uh, of, 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 of some stability from which to sure. work from. Um, and I did that across, you know, or, you know, put into place 
programs in place for the studio and for VFX that provide a lot of stability for the industry. Again, what was through a difficult time. And for me, you know, that was just awesome because we could reap the benefits of that. Right, every, every, It was a win-win for everybody to have some stability during a difficult time from, from a financial standpoint, but also from us, from a resource ramp standpoint, when, of course, it was already strained right, right uh, because of those new circumstances. Yeah, that's fascinating. That's fascinating. Um, um Okay, let's 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 talk about virtual production and sort of the the you know the promise of virtual production was going to save Hollywood during the pandemic and how that was, and and so how how that how that worked and and really what it is today yeah. and, and what so what what were your what was your journey through that whole process of virtual production? <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, yeah, I, I think um, again, just as a reminder, because I come up from a, like more of a producing. Yep mentality right it's more about um it's it's it had, how do we again it's thinking of production mm -hmm. challenges right so um for me you know when it was 20 probably 17 18 when i really got the bit between my teeth a little bit more at the mm -hmm. studio um although i was poking at it a little bit earlier but so we built a volume um i think i'd like to say 2018 on the lot um, again, it was just before I think Mandalorian wanted to come out, but it was kind of in and around the same time. Um, you know, obviously working with Lux and this guys and mm -hmm. those guys, and um, and you know, built it next to uh, what we call that Ted's Ted Surround was his kind of um, stage. We did a lot of his um, sort of group mm -hmm. discussions, and so I, in Culver I City, bought him right? as he exited. Um, no, actually on the lot in, in some. Oh, Sunset. okay, yeah, 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 um, yeah. Yeah. So as he exited um, from doing one of his, you know, speeches to mm -hmm. his team, I grabbed him and literally put him directly into my LED volume mm -hmm. stage, and he was just blown away. Like, this mm -hmm. is incredible. I said, "Well, you know, we had, I think we had a sunset scene up there or whatever it was, and um, you know, he, he pretended he was drinking margaritas mm -hmm. by the pool, and it was just a, it was an aha moment for him because he thought, wow, you know, um, this is going to be a huge, could be a huge opportunity.' And of course, then then COVID hits a little bit mm -hmm. later on, and we had already begin to sort of put into place um the concept of maybe some stages um and and gone into good partnership conversations with you know with epic with this guy's like you know the mm -hmm. usual players right um we were trying to form if you like a um kind of a lobby of conversation mm -hmm. um that kind of brought some kind of semblance of, of uniformity right. right to what was a very burgeoning business because obviously you know um Mandalorian doing great stuff was kind of its contained space where we were trying to set seeds in it across the business in a more sort of open sourcey mentality, I guess, right, um, to the business. So we started doing that, um, you know, hired some, again, really uh, great people in the inner area. Garish Balak Rishnam was my partner in crime there. Um, I, I grabbed him from Technicolor NPC after he'd done Lion King, the first one. And so we put in place this concept of, you know, virtual production, right? Do you have to travel everywhere to do something where you could, you know, be in one place or does everything really need to, do you have to build everything, you know, just begin to set so seeds of, of, of thoughts, you know, with line producers mm -hmm. and creatives. And then um, COVID came along, right? Um, and it, and everyone was like, this is the answer to everything. <laughs> <laughs> like, no, it's really not. Um, it, it, it is a answer to lots of some things, but not as much as you think in that time, right? Because right? it was very, very early days. And so the challenge actually became, in a way for me, was to kind of um, suppress some of the excitement <laughs> around, you know, it, this potential yeah. growth and opportunity. So, um, and, and, you know, we had, we were very lucky. We had a few productions, as I mentioned, like 1899, and there was a couple of shows in Korea which, which used it successfully. And there were other shows up and coming that wanted to sort of really lean in. But um, some shows, I mean, I'll be honest, um, whether it was Netflix or other, other other studios and other productions, wanted to get hold of it too quickly. They didn't have, you know, there wasn't enough skill sets, not just necessarily behind the camera, but, you know, quite frankly, you know, at the very highest creative level to know how to use it, right? And so, you know, I think it came a little bit of a victim of its own success earlier on or a victim of the times because of COVID. Um, and, and um, you know, as a result, I think, you know, a lot of there was some negativity, you know, that came around some of the lack of quality, the lack of reliability, et cetera, et cetera, just because it wasn't being used appropriately. Um, and I, what I'm really glad about right now is that because when I was thinking that, it's just we need organic growth. It needs to be grassroots mm -hmm. up, right? And that's how you grow these things. You can't just go, let's go big, you know. Well, I literally well. heard people say, um, can't we just Mandalorian this? <laughs> Yeah, right. that's the wrong yeah. attitude. And it's the yeah, there's a big, big mm -hmm. paintbrush right there, and it's like, um, and the answer is obviously mm -hmm. no. 
Um, but you know, if we you know um, you know think differently about how to structure its growth, um, pull back, um, have the right producers using it who know how to get the best. When I say producers, that can be creative, it can be technicians, mm-hmm. it can be anyone, right? People, creative producers and creators of content. Um, if they can really put the right, put it in the hands of the right people, um, um, you know, it will be used appropriately and be more successful over, over time. It will take mm-hmm. longer, um, but at least there'll be more success stories. Right. Um, and I think, you know, we're now at that point where we've had, a, there is a few success stories. Um, is I think some of the negativity hopefully is, is beginning to hopefully diminish a little bit because the more and more it's being used by people that are actually now really interested, but also have a competency. Right. Um, and I think that's, that's really, really important. And, you know, we were sitting on the snap stage, uh, the AI on the lot and, you know, I know the guys there and I think, you know, companies like Synapse, um, you know, who have a, just a mindset of production, right. Um, they're the right people to be managing and using that type of technology because they'll make sure they're over promising and under delivering, right. Which is always the bane of VFX. And obviously, but what do you well. think is the right attitude or the right knowledge or the right approach that people need to take this? That's going to give them the best success. <sighs> Uh, are we talking particular LED or any kind or? of virtual production? It's like if you could say someone's going to use in camera yeah. VFX and an LED volume. Well, that would be. Let's just right. start with that, for example. Well, it's like you know, for right. you to succeed, this is the way you need to approach it, or this is the way you need to think of it. What 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 are the secrets that they need to do, or what are the things they need to avoid, or expect they sh- they shouldn't expect? I guess. Yeah. Um, that's a really good question. It's obviously probably changing sure. all the time. But when I, when I when I think of it. Um, um, you know, as I'm looking at some projects, um, surprisingly, for me, what worked really well, uh, a, a real world um, sort of um, environments, backgrounds, um, sets, environments, etc. Um, <clears throat> and where you had, um, where you put the time in, in, in production design, right, um, to bring the physical set, if you like, you know, in towards the, the sort of virtual set and vice mm-hmm. versa, right? Um, and I think, you know, that's where Mandalorian's done, done really well. There's you know, been super considerate around areas, areas of, of that transition. Mm-hmm. Um, and to me, it's all about the transition, right? It's all about where the virtual world, the world meets the mm-hmm. real world. Um, so it, always thinking about that. And, you know, then you've got to think about, are you using it for in-camera final VFX or, or, or a lighting pass or, you know, um, what, what's your expectations on the, on the back end right. of this, right? <clears throat> are you really expecting to use this in-camera as a final or is it just a nice thing to have for the actors and for some lighting, obviously lighting for the director and the sure. DP, right? All of which are the right answer if that's relevant to, you know, to your budgeting, to your planning, et cetera, mm-hmm. et cetera. But that's really what it comes down to. It comes like a, sound like a broken record. Mm-hmm. Um, it's um, <clears throat> really having an understanding of, of how to use it appropriately, but understanding what the expectation is, you know, on the other end. And and if you have a clear understanding of those things, um, whether it's a you know highly you know spectacle sort of virtual science fi fantasy background, fine. But if you know, uh, and you know, again, for me, some of those areas work less well than interestingly uh, a physical set. Um, in, that sort of merges into a very sort of real world physical sort of virtual physical environment that you feel is a real world because you don't quite understand, you know, where the lines are because you're sort of, you, because they merge so well that that sort of transition is, is thought about so, 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 um, so thoroughly. And I think that for me is always the critical thing. Um, there's, I mean, obviously there's the typical use of, you know, out of the window, you know, card, shots you know process shots effectively which is the bread and butter you know for the technology effectively today um but there's so much more to offer (laughs) you know um i I just sort of did a sort of little breakdown of 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 a production for a studio and you know when i think of um you know the when you walk around a large stage or a large um, production there's so many stages sitting there doing nothing Right, dark days on the stage because you're waiting for a new director coming to the bl- another block on that on that on that on that set, so I can sit there for weeks doing mm-hmm. nothing. Right now, with 1899 as an example, you know we um, or they the production once we helped them with that sort of concept, um, they would switch their sets within hours. Right, wheeling in, wheeling out. The, literally, the crew had no time to go and get a cigarette. Mm-hmm. You know, you know you, you know we'd have a turntable and we'd move the set into the mm-hmm. volume. 
you know um so there's a lot of again planning and efficiency and how do we approach these 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 set changes efficiently and you know we were saving probably just from that process alone um maybe 20 percent more setups in a day right, right? um if you think about you know how much potential saving there is one through not having all those um stages sitting there yep. doing nothing but if you can be more efficient on your shoot by using a volume and you're increasing you know your your um sort of uh, your time in on the stage or reducing it by 20 percent mm -hmm. every time there's huge savings there potentially as well not always in visual effects mm -hmm. actually but actually more and more on the actual production, physical yeah. production itself yeah yeah yeah, I think it's I think it's fascinating that 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 that's the thing. What what do you think are the pitfalls that people fall into? Like the expectations that they have that 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 makes that doesn't work and ruins you know ruins the experience. What's the what's the one number one thing that people <coughs> should avoid thinking? That's going to save you a lot of money in VFX, yeah. right? I think um, I think there it certainly can. Yeah. By the way, um, but it, but you know you just got to think carefully about again. Um, the checks and balances um you know i think uh if you think you know you're going to build an environment um and you're going to turn up to the set and everything's going to be in camera and you're going to save 80 percent in your vfx cost i mean unlikely right right i think and, and if you're just more open-minded towards those area other areas of efficiency mm -hmm. i think you know then then you'll have more success um and again be more open-minded um around um I mean, it's again, production design is where it lives and breathes mm -hmm. for me, right? Um, people say, this is a VFX tool, surely. And I say, yeah, kind of, but actually, no, it, it's the production designer's mm -hmm. tool, right? And the DPs, but it's therefore, it's about sort of making sure that your production designer is front and center in all those conversations around how to leverage this right. environment, uh, this, this virtual space. Um, and, you know, I can guarantee you the more they're brought into that conversation way early during you know the vad exercise early on etc in previs um the more successful it's going to be um and the more value you'll get but i think you know where people make the biggest mistake is <sighs> just assuming you can rock up on the day shove some environments on there it's not great and there's just it you can be it takes a lot of planning sure. a lot of planning but it is worth it if yeah, you do that. absolutely i think it's fascinating i, I mean honestly speaking this is something i've actually had a, having been a visual effects artist and worked in visual effects and as a supervisor for years and years i've always had yeah. an issue with the fact that visual effects people are making decisions that should be made by art departments and cinematographers right, right. and then right. when you put that in camera right and it's not necessarily going to replace the effect but it puts the vision in their hands again you know what i mean and yeah, so right. like a cinematographer is like oh yeah that's the way it should look then that's them making that decision and there's changes that could be happening digitally that they have their hands on right and it sort of puts the onus back yeah. on cinematographers for them as opposed to just shooting a giant green screen and hoping for the best you know <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and by the way, I think, you know, that's where, you know, you think of um, the, the, the ability to have, you know, real time um, environments mm -hmm. and VFX playing through, you know, onto, onto mm -hmm. your screen, you know, effectively through key tag, et cetera. You know, um, and I know you're engaged in aspects of, of that sure. conversation for sure. It's like the more you can bring into real mm -hmm. time, you know, um, and have, you know, your your DP, you know, your, your director, um, understand the space they're dealing with, right? And obviously, as we know, it's like, um, you know, there's quite a lot of previs that you often have bring into, into the, you know, obviously onto the stage on the day. And the more that takes on a, a real uh, sort of photo real quality, um, the more decisions can be made that actually sort of affect or reduce some of the effect that are made later in post because they make the right decisions on the day with the vision of the gestalt of, you know, the world they're standing mm -hmm. in right and i think that's really really important that you know sometimes decisions are made in a vacuum during production because they don't understand that future space but the more you bring that future space into you know literally you know as you're standing on right. set that you have that understanding that vision of the world that you're in then hopefully there's less wrong decisions made later right. on right well i think that's fascinating i think uh, i think it's really uh, it's it's really cool. I I that's my favorite part of virtual production is not necessarily just going to solve this magic bullet, but that we're f filmmaking again. <laughs> yeah. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. No. For sure. And and you know um yeah obviously there is the as you say the real time the here and now on yeah. on set which is, is just so exciting and obviously big advances huge advances being made there and and AI is obviously yeah I was going to get to uh, that <laughs> opportunity there. Uh, 
um, you know, but also, you know, just again, the planning, the previs, you know, the uh, getting to the point where previs actually sort of um, is more than just, you know, sort of, I guess, uh, um, a visual piece for a show reel or for a sizzle sure. reel is actually mean something. Right. Um, in terms of camera, in terms of position, in terms of just understanding, yeah, again, what you need on the day, all that tech biz that comes with it, um, has obviously always been part of the story. But the more real it looks, the more, you know, and a creative can understand the impact of what the, you know, the day on set's gonna sure. look like. The just again, even even smarter decisions get made even even earlier up the pipeline. So again, it's all it's all fantastic. And that's what ex- that's what excites me about. So actually being back on this side, because I'm hopefully doing more in production than I was when I was at Netflix and Disney, mm-hmm. etc., is actually getting to use some of the tools <laughs> that right. I've been pushing people towards over these years. And that's what's exciting. Well tell us a little bit about uh you know, speaking of tools, tell us a little bit about how you know the the world is transitioning to a world post uh, or uh, the AI revolution, right? Like how, how do you yeah. feel that that's going to impact things and how do we deal with that responsibly and how do we deal with that yeah. and creatively and financially? <laughs> like how does it all work? Yeah. I mean, I am, I'm certainly find myself in, in a bunch of different conversations around, you know, um, I say different parts of that sort of, I guess, conversation and, and it's, it's intriguing. It's, it's really, if I'm thinking about um, <laughs> the ghost scene where you're creating this vase, mm-hmm. right, um, out of out of clay, you know, where are we at mm-hmm. right now? You know, I'm like, I'm just trying to think: Are we just slopping down the clay, or we is it? We got our hands on the clay yet? You know, what does it look? Like? Is it a jar? Is it a, what is this thing we're, we're, we're creating nice. on this with this yeah. lump of clay? Um, and I'm trying to, you know, figure out where we are. And and you know, I, I genuinely feel that you know, right now we've just slopped on that piece of clay. And we just we just sprayed it, and it, and the wheels just started right. turning. Um, and I think you know, the more people start, and I've just sort of come up with this analogy, just as you, you asked the question. So apologies, I haven't thought this through, <laughs> but I'm just thinking the more hands-on you are, you know, um, the more you get to understand what it is you're dealing with. And I think there's a lot of people talking about it with uh, and looking at, it, at spinning as a lump of clay on a wheel without really understanding mm-hmm. it. And and I think so. I feel like I'm kind of just getting my hands on the clay, and I'm just the wheel started spinning and I'm beginning to play with with its form and i can begin to understand i guess some of the promise and i can begin to understand some of the pitfalls obviously and the challenges and of course ai is already or machine learning ai is already being a uh, uh, providing a lot of value you know in visual effects if you might say in terms of pr- the process around you know some of the, the sort of more straightforward tasks as we know obviously um when it comes to segmentation and uh you know sort of um, tr- tracking and sort of rotate etc and there's a lot of interesting but it's been doing that for years for way but it's been but but (laughs) it has but it has been that for a while and so you know it's like at what point does it you know really start sort of you know coming to our next level and of course we're not there yet right um on a purely sort of image creation standpoint because as we know um a lot of what it comes out of the other end or comes, you know, in, uh, onto your screen. Uh, how, how has that been sourced, that material? Um, now, obviously, as you pointed out, there are some companies that are obviously providing their clusters with, um, you know, the, the, the data to learn, mm-hmm. right? So it's effectively, ethically, you might say there's pixels coming your way or, or have been ethically mm-hmm. cleansed. You know, there's in terms of they're sort of, they're, they're, you know, they're, they're, they're okay to deal with because you own them effectively. Um but you know, there's awful lots in the you know, out there, which is you know just you might say stolen pixels. I'm not sure if that's a term that, that gets used too right. often, but I but it's I've heard it a lot recently, and you know that's fantastic for sort of getting ideas on a page, right? Now some I, I there's a lot of concern there as well because obviously some people do that for a living, sure. right? In terms of you know putting images and getting you know one's creative juices flowing about their early concepts. But I genuinely think that you know um, it the. The, the, the checks and balances in a positive way is that the more you can get out there visually and ideas on a page with a creative from a studio getting more engaged because they actually understand that a little bit more than they did. Maybe if it was most general, um, sort of more traditionally sort of um, represented, the more productions hopefully go into production because they understand the outcome earlier. We get back to sort of you know bringing things forward. So I think there's some positive there, um, but I think when it comes obviously to um, what hits the screens, what hits the theaters, what hits, you know, our streaming services, et cetera. Um, you know, I think we're in the very early days there of, of, of figuring out how to, um, you know, create content, 
you know, in a way that, you know, a scale, we come back to scale. Sure, there'll be one or two productions that do it. Um, but is it going to change the face of the industry? I think so. But I think there's a few more years to, to come before we really understand what that outcome will be. But it's going to happen, right? It's just about at what level and what scale and for what type of content. Um, and that, that's, you know, where I'm sort of got my hands on the clay and trying to get a better understanding of, you know, how quickly I'm going to make a vase. But um, it's it's very early days for me. But, yeah, certainly when it comes to what you're dealing with, right, you're, what you're mm-hmm. solving for, I mean, there's so much opportunity there. It's like when I think of LED volume and, you know, uh, the, you know, just bringing an environment onto an LED screen, how expensive right. that is, right? Just in terms of render, just in terms of everything that goes into creating that type of content. You know, where, where AI, I think, is obviously already being hugely mm-hmm. influential. You think of nurse and, you know, all that kind of goes in spats, et cetera. There's, there's a lot of opportunity there to sort of, you know, bring about those environments much more efficiently, much more effectively, much quicker, right. much cheaper. And that will only help the virtual production space in the LED I mean there's form. so many forms of it right I mean you you mentioned uh, yeah. we're, we're I mean we're using AI tools or, or, or machine learning tools for a lot of different opportunities but just AI denoising right the fact that we've right. done that right. has enabled an entire Huge. workflow <laughs> that has made things yeah I mean that, that's the thing it's like little, you think just a little, you're opening just the, uh, the door yeah. just a little bit, but it's just uh, that little bit lets a lot of yeah, light through. It does. Right? Nice just pun, too. one little crack in the door. <laughs> yeah, thank you. I was sort of, you know, thinking of you when I, when I, did, when I came up with that one. Um, but it's, it is, it doesn't take much to light yeah. up a room. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so there you no, go. No, it's absolutely true. And I think that these, there's, there's, there's some really some interesting things. And I think there's a challenge that people are going to have to do to figure out uh, in terms of, you know, whether they're doing things ethically. I do think on a personal level, I just, I don't like courts of public opinion. I think that court should be settled in court. And when there's copyright issues, people should figure that out. And I think there's some people who are doing that and that's the right thing to do, you know, so that we all know, right. yeah. well, someone gave me a guideline and that's the whole point of, of yeah. legal things. It's like, that's the guideline. That's the rules I'll follow. Right. Uh, but I think that's great. But at the same time, I think that there are some really interesting things, you know, stuff like that L. Albrecht is doing over at Metaphysics is fascinating. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, so I think that there's, there's good. And I think it's interesting that the filmmaking is going to go down this line at some point, right? <laughs> Yeah, I, I think so. I mean, um, again, you know, when I think of timeframes, um, it's important that studios and filmmakers and just creators in general um, are engaged in, in the conversations, as you say, with the ethical, um, let through the ethical mm-hmm. lens for sure. Um, because at some point, yeah, it's going to really, really take off. It'll in a become a lot at and, some point. <laughs> you know, that, it's become a lot, very, very, and it'll be a lot, I think, very sure. quickly. Because let's face it, I mean, the whole concept of AI, it's, it's the learning of exponential. I, mean, it, I think, you know, the exponential learning yep. is just goes through the roof, right? So do you almost, what's the what's the law about yeah. the chip? <laughs> well, the Moore's law, you mean? Um, well, yeah. yeah, there you go. It's like, I think you mentioned in our conversation, of course, that's now a thing yeah. of the past, right? So, you know, you do it once and and and, and before that might have taken sure. many iterations and a fair time for it to become something at scale. Sure. But of course, now that's... I think the thing also is that people think it's going to be less creative, taking away creative jobs, et cetera, et cetera. I disagree. And 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 Ed and I said this in, in the panel at your... At uh, at the, we should mention that you moderated that panel at AI on the lot, which was fantastic. But I think there's one thing that I got a lot of feedback from that is that you know, Ed and I were talking about how AI tools is enabling the creatives to be more creative, right? right? Yeah, and th- that mm-hmm. from yeah, AI denoising, yeah. allowing for a different level of virtual production to happen on the walls, which enables cinematographers to be cinematographers again, uh, and to feel <laughs> like they're. And the same yeah. thing that Ed was saying about what he was doing in metaphysics is that this was sort of in because of its real time nature, it was enabling actors mm. to feel more empowered by their performance mm. that they could see what they were doing yeah. in real time. Absolutely. And so I think that's really the beauty of it is that it's, it, it is not necessarily, you, you can actually see it as an empowering creativity as opposed to taking it away. Yeah, I think so. I totally agree. And, you know, um, I think of, you know, production itself, um, creating is a risky mm-hmm. business, um, you know, not knowing what things are going to look like in sure. the end, right? Or, or being able to poke at um, 
uh, I guess, some of the challenges and problems problem sets early on. And I think everything AI, a lot of things AI is doing in this creative space is de-risking production. Right. Um, right? And that's how I, that's how I think of it. it yeah. Right? How my, yeah. So I, that's how I think it's like reducing the unknowns. Mm-hmm. Um and that's kind of how what I see is, I mean, that's a very broad sure. view of it, right? But that's how I think of AI. It's de-risking uh, uh, the creative industry to a point where somebody say, well, what are you sure there's fun in not knowing? But, you know, I can tell you, you know, when you're making stuff, you know, as a studio or creative, you really want to know earlier on how, how yep. stuff's going to turn out. So the more, the, the work, again, the work mm-hmm. you're doing, Thank as you, you say, is very, is part of, is a part of that reducing the unknowns, yeah. right? Um, de-risking the business. I think that's what's yeah. exciting. Thank you. They, I mean, that's, that's the goal. I mean, uh, I want to, uh, for myself personally, but also for anyone of the, that's working with us, like, I want to empower creative people who want to tell stories in great ways. Yeah. And if that's a tool that can let them get there, then awesome. <laughs> yeah. yeah, absolutely. That's yeah. all for that. For uh, sure. Well, thank you so much, Andy. This has been amazing having you on. A very, very insightful in terms of where you've been and, and, and your position in the industry as well as where you think things are going. Uh, I'd, I'd love to, uh, you know, obviously continue this conversation. <laughs> and we could probably do it some other right, point yep. and see where, where you are. But but tell us where you what you're doing now and, and what we can look forward to some of the things you're up to. <clears throat> yeah, a great question. Um, you know, since leaving Netflix, uh, definitely sort of um, thought a bit of time to think about the future mm-hmm. would be great. And of course, I've yeah. done that, um, which has been great. And now it is about sort of, you know, I've got a few projects I'm looking at. I can't go into too sure. much detail, but, um, you know, back on the production side, but also looking at some con- content creation on my end too. There's a bunch of different things I'm sort of poking at um, in different sides uh, of the business. And, you know, I'm hoping over the next, next three to six months, you know, one of those will uh, come out up in front, but we'll see. There's, it's an interesting time in the business, right? Yeah, now, yeah, you know. absolutely. I think I think we're in the middle of a creative resolu- revolution, and I think it's really exciting to see what, where this is all going to go. Yeah, so. absolutely, absolutely. Well, thanks very much for inviting me on, and uh, it's good to see you again, Christopher. Thank you.